ready. We're recording. This is recorded. <laughs> Real. Okay. Today with two extremely special guests. I'm very excited. To my left, we have Pastor Matthew Barnett, and he is, what would I call you, the head of the Dream Center or the pastor? That of the is Dream perfect, Center. head of the Dream Center. Head of the Dream Center. <laughs> so he is, he kind of runs the Dream Center. If you saw my Ready or Not music video, yes. that is what the Dream Center is. And then to the left of Pastor Matthew, we have my dad. Hey guys. Daddy, <laughs> who I have to be honest, he's here because last night I was telling him, I was like, Dad, you know, I'm going to interview Pastor Matthew tomorrow. He's like, oh, can I come? And I'm like, yeah, do you want to be in it? So <laughs> one more thing before we hop right in so you guys know what we're talking about today. This month has been all about happiness. Just things that you do to try to be happy. And I felt like the perfect way to close out the month and to kind of make everything complete is in service. Because I do feel like giving back to others and being involved in a community is what really makes you feel happy. And I feel like you're such a good example of that because you've done so much with the Dream Center. Um, so I guess we're just gonna jump right in. So why don't you tell everyone where you're from and how this got started. Well, I was born in Davenport, Iowa. Iowa? So, I mean, the Midwest, like right in the middle of the Midwest. That's my mom. Isn't that crazy? Davenport, Iowa, and then I was raised in Phoenix, Arizona, and then at 20, I came to LA. So I started the Dream Center at 20, and uh, with a little food bag on a table, that's all I had. Which, that's six years younger than me, to put that into perspective. And I, yes, and now I'm approaching 40, and, and now, and um, it's, it's yes, but I, anyways, I've been here for 20 years, <laughs> And uh, the journey's been ex extraordinary. Again, one food bag on a desk is where I started pastoring in downtown next to a liquor store. And uh, so I always tell young people or anybody that whenever they want to start serving, yeah. you know, value what you have in your hand. And then never say to yourself, well, when I have something great, then I'll do something compassionate or nice. Yeah. It all begins with whatever you have in your hand. For me, yeah. it was enough money to buy one food bag to give away to a family. And I didn't, never realized that 30,000 people a week would be fed today. That's so crazy. Now, I know I read your book. So I think that the beginning um, is really cool. So you were down here, and you were originally, you started a church. And how did that all happen? I know you were at like the Silver Lake Park, and it's a really <laughs> cool story. He doesn't know what I'm asking you, by the way. I'm just kind of shooting stuff out. So how did that unfold? Well, my dad was looking for a pastor for a church, and he couldn't find one because nobody wanted to be in the neighborhood next to a liquor store and a lot of gangs in the neighborhood. Yeah. So he couldn't find a real pastor, so he asked me. You know, so I was like, a, I was like, <laughs> you're a, a real pastor, you I'm, count. Yeah, I was eleven on the list of ten. You know, I said, well, you know what? I'm crazy enough to try it. Doesn't make sense? Then hey, might make history. You never know. Yeah. So I started, and I uh, was in for a rude awakening. I had to go through several years of not realizing that I wasn't the traditional pastor. A lot of people left because I was so young, and I understand their point. I didn't know what I was doing, yeah. but I realized that loving and serving and compassion were the open door to everything. And I just started saying, you know, I got a bag of food. Well, maybe something could start by just valuing that. Yeah. And that's where it started. And now we're in this hospital today, the Dream Center. There's hundreds of people living here, going through recovery, homeless families. And so I just want to encourage someone out there that you just kind of feel like, I want to do something great for people. Start in your school. Yeah. Start going and, and start by finding the person nobody wants to sit by the cafeteria and sitting by that person and being different, yeah. being an individual. You don't go with the crowd and do something that's never been done before. And so I tell my kids all the time, look for the kid that feels unloved or forsaken mm -hmm. and be a friend to them. And so that's, that's how you stand out and be different than the culture. You change it by doing unique things like that. I was just listening to a Rick Warren podcast this morning. He was saying something that you just said. Mm. He said, don't um, conform to the world, but like dive into the world. I wish I had like a more how yeah. he said it. He but, said it so eloquently, but sure. he essentially said that, that by doing those things, that that is how you stand out. So that's interesting. Dad, do you have a question? Yeah, I do because, I, you know, your, your dad was so successful, is still so successful, and he's been a leader's leader. And so many pastors have come to him for help, and he's helped so many churches grow. And when you came out here, I know you had your dad's help. And it, on the surface, I think anyone would have said, okay, this is a shoe-in. Because the pastor's got his dad, and his dad's great success. But you did not have great success in the beginning, did you? No, I didn't. And the funny thing about it is I would ask my dad for advice, but he would say things like this. He would say, you know what? You know what you're doing. And looking back, I said, Dad, why didn't you ever give me advice? Why didn't you tell me what I needed to do? He said, because when you were young, I didn't want to kill your idealistic dreams about a 24-7 place. You didn't need somebody to tell you what you could and could not do in a traditional model. You just needed someone to stand behind you. 
And uh, that's what okay. my dad did. He just said, my mentorship with you is just to unconditionally believe in your dreams because if I try to give you advice, I might shape the dream into what I want. You just need someone to get behind you. So it went through a lot of battles, a lot of trials, a lot of threats. I've had, um, um, I've, I've been in places where I've tried to encourage people that maybe it was over my head or approach gang members have been threatened by those type of things. I've been through everything in 20 years. But um, there's one thing about life. I mean, when you live your life to, to serve your generation, it just seems that uh, that's the proper foundation by which to build. And uh, that's happened. I'll, I'll never forget the first time I wanted to reach the community gang members. Oh. Um, the service was over and I had no money. I said, we're going to start a, an outreach to help the fitness these guys in the neighborhood. And I went to Kmart, bought those cheap weights, you know, the ones you lift that if you drop them, like in the old days, the concrete would come out. So you'd have a, you'd have a 10 pound weight, but if you dropped it, it would be like eight and a half because it was all concrete. And so I said, come and join me at the lot. We're going to lift weights together, those cheap old weights yeah. that would fall off, you know, and you'd have to balance it. I'm sure but, you were lifting as great as the game. Right, exactly. Yeah. No way. But that's where it started. I had a little wall where they can create some artwork. Huh. And and I and I think this generation is, is hungry to make a difference. They're hungry yeah. to change, you know, whether they be somewhere in the Midwest or the South and they're watching this, they're like, What can I do? Right. Look at what you're most passionate about, step out and do it, yeah. and you'll begin to see something. That, that's why we're here ministry um, all these people that are watching this. Yeah. Because because someone stepped out like yourself, Nikki, and you took a risk and said I believe that we have a message to give and encouragement to give and all of you are just full of such love and joy and if that's all you have to give is your love and joy and passion, you never know where it will take you yeah. and uh, you, this conversation is evidence of that. Yeah, okay, I have another question. So what has been, because this has been a long time, and like you were saying, you, know, you didn't have success in the beginning of it, no. but what has been, and this is kind of a broad question, what has been the hardest part of all this or the biggest thing to overcome, if that makes sense? The biggest thing to overcome is self-confidence and believing that the ideas that are in your heart can work. Wow. Because the one, really one night, I never forget when I walked around, I had nothing left. I, I showed up into a church building and not one person showed up. A 700 wow. seat building that was empty. And I took a walk around the city and I saw gang members getting arrested against police cars. I saw helicopters looking for criminals. I saw every hurting thing and I can imagine one part. And that was the night where I decided, you know what? I'm going to die to all the things I think I want to do with my life, and I just want to start helping people. And whatever that looks like, whatever form that's going to take on, um, the best part of my life was during the greatest failure. And sometimes you think you're going through the biggest failure, but your failure is actually being recreated into something that only failure can teach you. So failure is what, what really birthed the Dream Center. I had nothing left but a walk, but in that walk I saw my city. I saw all the needs and decided that was a day, one by one, I was going to step out and respond. So, um, so let me ask you something. Confidence has been the hardest thing. Let me ask you. So, you know, people, we get caught up in feelings a lot, yes. right? And sometimes doing the right thing doesn't feel good, but we do it anyway. But sometimes we walk around feeling good, and then sometimes we don't feel so good. Did you feel? <laughs> did you feel a shift in like your emotional center or your attitude when you had that epiphany or that in that dawning that I'm going to die to myself and give and serve others? Was there? Yes, I did have, I think the revelation that I received in my life was, I'm not going anywhere. I, I finally felt that I was going to stay in LA mm -hmm. and not leave because quitting was a constant option. Yeah, yeah. Going back home, I went on the freeway back to Phoenix at least 10 times to quit, you know. I was driving down the road <laughs> heading there. So over and over I, I went through that, but I think there was the, the revelation there was a resolve to say, you know what, I'm not leaving this city until something good happens, until change happens. and so. Um, it wasn't a, an emotional revelation as much as it was a foundational revelation that, you know, if I stay here and commit myself and you take on these needs, over time, I'll figure out the answers. I think sometimes you feel like, oh, once I figure everything out, then I'll do something. Sometimes the answer is just to stay and not leave. And, and the formula comes to you as you go. I'm sure that um, what, what you've done hasn't oh, come totally. overnight. But you've decided, you've committed yourself to what you're doing, to spreading a positive inspiration to the world. And as you've done that, now you're, you see all these great music begin to unfold. Who knows what's going to happen I next? mean, I'm a pop star now. So yeah, exactly. Know. You <laughs> are. Absolutely. That's basically what happened. That's exactly what's happened. So, you know, my grandpa used to say, you hang around long enough, something good's going to happen to yeah. you. Yeah. And I really believe that longevity is the key to anything. That's so interesting that you just, you had, like, the determination and you figured it out as you went. As you went. That's exactly right. I feel like that is such a good statement across the board. So not only within, like, what we're talking about, about getting involved, but I noticed that, like you just said, with my thing and when other people are asking me, oh, should I do this? I don't have all this figured out. I'm like, 
dude, just do it. You're going to figure it out as you yes. go. Because that's how it's been for me. I spent like six months leading up to it. Oh, should I do this? Oh, should I do that? And once I dove in, I just figured it out. Exactly. So it's really interesting. And a lot of things you might not understand completely, like how to do. Like I, like I don't understand drug and alcohol rehab because I've never been in a position of, of the people that we're reaching out to. But I had a love for them. And uh, love always finds a way to create vision. Vision and love go hand in hand. You love something long enough, you'll get the vision for it. You'll figure it out along the way. And so although I don't understand everything about recovery, I had a passion for it. And I was able to surround myself with people who understood how to do recovery. Homeless families. We took in our first homeless family that was in a car. I said, can we just take in one family? Didn't realize 185 people would be living here that are homeless families. But vision opened the door to people that understood how to reach homeless families. Yeah. So sometimes visionaries don't have all the practical answers, but they have a love and a, and a, and a megaphone, which is their passion. Yeah. And then it just seems to attract people that can, can help you fulfill those type of things. Yeah. Now, I don't know how to quite put this into a question or if this is a statement or you can hop in at any point because I'm not yeah, quite yeah. sure. Have you found that it's like you've had this vision, but you've had to also be flexible as things oh. have come in and like let your vision kind of morph or I don't know what do you have to say to that I guess absolutely <laughs> oh all the time and that's the key is always being flexible yeah. and um, being responsive you know and and uh, that's happened so many times in my life where um, I've had to just respond to a need I didn't understand anything about it. I had to adapt and grow I think that's where that's what separates greatness from from people that level off, uh, people that are great, like people my dad. That what? Uh, from people that level off in oh, their, level in their off. vision, like plateau. Oh. or plateau. You know, my dad called me the day. He's 77. He's one of the most successful pastors in the country, and yeah. people come to him from advice from all over the world. And he called me on the phone. He said, "Son, I need to ask your advice about something." He's been asking my advice since I was 20 years of age, when I should be sitting continually at his, his feet. And one thing I've realized that he understood is that a visionary never stops learning. They never stop growing, mm -hmm. and you've never arrived. Yeah. You've never got to the place to where you're at a completed place. And so, as you remain teachable and flexible and learning, um, it's endless how far you can you can go. So, yeah. I would encourage those of you to be flexible, be teachable out there. And yeah. um, there's people out there that know more than you. Sometimes they don't know more than you, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, you you can always learn something from anyone in this world. Hey mom, you were a good one for that. I remember when I was dancing and I used to show up to dance classes sometimes, I would end up in like, I'd show up to class and there would only be like a level one ballet class. Oh. I'd be like, oh, I can only take level one. And my mom would be like, well, there's always something to learn. Did you learn something while That's you were there? That's good. I'd be like, That's I good. don't know, maybe like my plies got better. And she was like, well, then it was worth it. So it's, it's true, I think that that applies like to everything. And we actually met this CEO at Christmas and he said the same thing. He was like, you just keep learning that's how you move forward so that's really interesting how it and, and sometimes failure can be your greatest learning you know yeah. and sometimes insecurity can be your greatest leader um, mm -hmm. you can learn from insecurity I know a lot of times I've I've lived in in, in, in that insecurity I begin to realize that you know it's okay to be insecure about things even when you're trying to reach out a little bit because that's how you grow in confidence and that's how you move forward and and I've had those moments where the task was bigger than me and then mm -hmm. and I begin to look inside and say I can't do this I can't do this I can't do this but I begin to I begin to pray, I begin to talk to other people who are barrier breakers, who have gone beyond the ordinary, and, yeah. and found out that they all feel the same way too. I haven't met one person in any industry that's gone beyond what they were capable of doing who didn't have to overcome insecurity. I, I love what my dad says, he always says that, wanting to quit is a sign of success. Yeah, that's good. Because it means that you have something to quit. Yeah. Only successful people can have the desire to want to quit. So if you want to quit something, it probably means that you're attempting something great. That's and awesome. that's a good sign. That's awesome. Well, okay, I have like an ending question, but before we go to that, did you have any other questions you no, want to I'm ask? No, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, so you've kind of already like summed this up in this, but I just kind of want to tie it with a little bow at the end. If someone is sitting there and they're like, wow, this is so great and so inspirational. What do I do? And they wanted like really practical steps as to how to start something or get involved somewhere in their community, like in Iowa or wherever. What would you tell them if they were well, sitting there? Well, I'm qualified to speak to the people in Iowa and Wisconsin. Yes, and across specifically the country. Iowa. And uh, really what it is is find that one great need in your city. Every city's got one specific need that I believe that people are passionate about. Find what that great need is and just step out and just start doing something. Start tackling the issue. Um, whether it be uh, you have a, a desire to help people in recovery, if you have a desire to help teenagers at an after school, and whatever the program will be, find the one great need in your city How would you and find it? resource it. 
you usually find it with what you're passionate about the most because okay. what you're passionate about is usually you know what the prevailing need of the city really is or yeah. simply something that needs to be met because you've been around it enough to, to, to be able to passion. respond yeah. so um, I, I would step out to the one thing in your city that you feel that is your mandate and then do something you know rather it be to start raising money for it, rather it be to garage sale just get some energy going in the direction of the vision to work and have a spark to create the momentum and uh, I, I know somebody about my, my, uh, my daughter the other day she, she has a really passion to uh, so we're one of the ministries here for the homeless families and do something for Christmas. And she said, well, Dad, I don't know if I can ever be able to help all the families. I said, well, let's help one. And so we did a little event and took a family out to a movie and all that. And now it's like she's contagious. She wants to help every single family she can yeah. find. Because the hardest thing to do in any vision is to start. If you yeah. could just get started, starting and finish yeah. in any dream are the hardest things to do. If you could just get started and activate momentum, get 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 some resource raised, or just go help somebody and uh, minister to the need of the person that you're the most passionate about. Sometimes it's not money, it's resource, it's a smile, it's encouragement, it's whatever you have in your heart. And never despise what you have in your heart, even if you have nothing in your hand, because that's oftentimes what people need the most in the first place. That's so good. I feel like that was literally the perfect bow tie ending. This was great. Well, I don't really have a way to end it other than that's perfect. Um, be sure, we are actually going to go film a music video right now. Nice. And you awesome. guys have to be sure to check that out. All of the proceeds from the music video are going right back to the Dream Center, 100%. So please purchase those. Yes. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Pastor Matthew. And we will see you very soon. Love you. Thank you. All Thank right, you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.